excited to have so many people here joining us for uh, what I hope will be an important and timely discussion. And we're joined by some pretty amazing folks um, who are uh, part of the Head of the Charles Gold Cup grant recipient uh, for this inaugural year of funding. Um, we're so excited about the great work that they're doing and um, excited that you guys will get to hear about all that great work today. Um, I am Daphne Warchenko. I'm a member of the grant uh, committee and I'll be helping to moderate today's discussion, but I really um, am hoping that we're gonna have a very dynamic and uh, fun conversation. Um, I would love to introduce our amazing speakers here today. Uh, we are joined first by Jordan Mueller. Uh, he is with Boston Community Rowing. Jordan is the current youth outreach coordinator at Baltimore Community Rowing. And his rowing journey started as a freshman in high school in 2008 in Liverpool, New York, which is just outside of Syracuse. After rowing for four years in high school, he went on to Hobart and William Smith Colleges, where he was fortunate enough to row varsity all four years. Since Jordan started coaching in 2012, 2013, he's had the opportunity to coach a wide variety of levels that range from middle school learn to row programs to masters. And he's even had the opportunity to coach his high school boys novice rowing team for two years. Uh, as the youth outreach coordinator at DCR, Jordan looks forward to sharing his love for the sport um, to the youth of Baltimore and beyond. So thank you for joining us today, uh, Jordan. We also have Brooke. Brooke Gimmer is the current lead coach for the DC Stroke Serve Your City Youth Rowing Program, senior assistant coach for Athletes Without Limits, assistant coach for Wakefield High School. And if that wasn't enough, he's also founder of Ethiopian Rowing. He grew up in Arlington, Virginia, attending Wakefield High School. Shout out to the DMV, I'm from there as well, uh, where he began his rowing journey. And he continued rowing as a recruit at Washington College, where he received his bachelor's of science in biology with minors in chemistry and public health. He is also currently working at GlaxoSmithKline Pharmaceuticals as a biopharmaceutical manufacturing associate. Brooke is passionate about serving his community and excited to be a part of this panel. Thanks for joining us, Brooke. Uh, very happy to have Brandon Johnson here with us. Brandon is a Philadelphia native, a current resident, and head coach and owner of BLJ Community Rowing, one of the most diverse community rowing programs in the Philadelphia metro area. At the age of 15, Brandon learned to row at the Fairmont Park Community Rowing Program and after high school went on to row for all four years at the University of Texas with a full athletic scholarship. In 2003, Brandon competed as a single scholar in the internationally known Henley Royal Regatta, which is one of the most prestigious regattas held on the Thames River in England. Beautiful, of course. Brandon began teaching rowing classes through Mount Airy Learning Tree in 2003, and now teaches numerous rowing courses during the spring, summer, and fall for Chester County Night School and Mainline, Night, uh, Mainline School. Brandon also teaches an introduction to rowing course for Temple University in the kinesiology department, uh, affectionately called a boathouse without walls, does not have walls. BLJ Community Rowing spawned from Brandon's vision of having a community rowing program that is available to all. Uh, and thus the formation of the BLJ Community Rowing, which is officially incorporated in 2013, um, has since expanded to include course offerings to other community centers and private schools. Thank you for having, uh, for being here with us, Brandon. Next, I'm gonna introduce Craig White. Craig is a coach at St. Benedict's Prep, which he graduated from in 2004. After leaving St. Benedict's Prep, he moved on to the College of William and Mary, where he graduated with a bachelor's in economics in 2009. He worked and lived in Washington, D.C. for two years before moving back to New Jersey in 2011. Craig returned to St. Benedict's in 2011 and currently teaches Algebra 1, 1B, and Advanced Algebra. I have to say those were not my favorite subjects when I was in school. Uh, and after school, his primary responsibility is the development of the rowing program. Uh, St. Benedict's Preparatory School maintains a team of 60 rowers, training year-round and rowing on the Passaic I don't know if I said that right, River of the Kearney High School Boathouse, and competes at regattas that are everywhere from Washington, D.C. to upstate New York. And the, power, the program has become a really powerful example of what can happen if you offer rowing to kids at schools and places where rowing is still mostly absent. And I hope that that will be a central part of the conversation that we have here today. Thanks, Craig. 
And then last but certainly not least, I'm very happy to introduce Ashley Pryor. Ashley is the CEO, founder of Relentless Rowing Academy, the director of operations for Ohio State Women's Rowing in the third season, owns a, and owns a gym, Relentless Fit Factory. Ashley's from Westerville, Ohio. She's a first-generation college student. She holds a bachelor's of science, is earning a, a holds a bachelor's of science in human development and family science, which she earned in 2013, and a master's of arts in higher education and student affairs, which she got in 2015. Both are from the Ohio State University. Ashley played one year of college basketball for Ohio State in Newark, her freshman year of college, before transferring to Ohio State main campus, where she walked onto the women's rowing team, winning a Big Ten championship in 2011 and completing one year of varsity. Ashley has most recently returned to the sport as a master's rower in the spirit of launching Relentless Rowing Academy. And her time in sports is where she was nicknamed AP, and she continues to go by that nickname. Before being an entrepreneur and returning to athletics, Ashley served as assistant director of alumni affairs and was director of social change at Ohio State. Since 2013, Ashley has traveled the country facilitating over 40 workshops on topics such as leadership, development, social change, holistic wellness, and fitness. She created and presented a documentary in 2014 about critical race theory and published an athletic article in 2015 about career development of Division I Black male athletes with professional sports aspirations. In March of 2018, Ashley won the inaugural Integrity Leadership Award from her profession's national organization, NASPA. And she was selected for the prestigious Dr. Charles Whitcomb NCAA Leadership Institution Cohort from 2019 to 2021. In 2020, Ashley completed and graduated from her level two coach certification with US Rowing and was an inaugural winner of the Head of the Charles Gold Cup Grant and Changemaker Scholarship from Steady State Newark Network. Uh, Ashley is excited that Relentless Rowing is gearing up for their first racing season. And uh, some fun facts, she loves Star Trek and Finding Dory is one of her favorite movies, which is why she chooses to just keep swimming no matter what. So as you can see, we have an outstanding panel here with us today to talk about retention in the sport of rowing, a topic that is very near and dear to my heart and very near and dear to the hearts of our panelists today. Um, and I just wanna start by hearing from everyone about your experiences, what got you to stay in the sport and what made it difficult? Uh, I can go first. Um, what got me to stay in the sport? I think, so I, in high school, prior to that, I guess middle school, uh, I was kind of always in a lot of different sports. So basketball, soccer, this, that, and the other thing. And uh, I think the thing that drew me to rowing first and foremost, and that has kept me here especially, is that it's it's like the epitome of a team sport to me. Um, that other than like being in a single, you can't do it alone. Um, there's not just, you know, two or three people that you meet on a field or on a court or in a pool or something and say, okay, go and do it. Um, everyone needs to work together, be able to work toward a common goal. Um, and I think that was something that I was really missing in those like younger years in sports. And then when I got to high school and kind of fell into rowing, um, it's just something that has always really stuck with me that this to me is what a sport should be. This is what like a family is essentially should be when you're, you know, you're in it together uh, to kind of get to your uh, common goal. Um, so that's kind of what draw, or drew me to it and got me in it. And what, what if anything's made it difficult to stay with the sport? I don't think there's anything that's made it difficult to stay. I couldn't imagine my life, which is maybe like a really corny answer, but I, I generally don't think there's anything that has made it difficult to stay in the sport or there's never been an, a time where I thought to myself, well, like, I, I guess I'm just gonna hang up my oar. I well, hang up my oar. <laughs> like I'm gonna pack up my bags and, and I'll be on my way. Like I just, I've always loved the sport and I don't know what my life would be without it. And I really don't wanna ever find out. Other thoughts, Ashley, Corey, anyone else? <clears throat> uh, I can go. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Growing in Color for inviting me to be part of this panel. And uh, second of all, I'm excited that to be part of this panel with the wonderful rowers and coaches. 
And uh, speaking about my experience, uh, so I'm originally from Ethiopia and I moved in when I was 13. Uh, I was a swimmer when I was in Ethiopia and I came in here, uh, I, you know, I barely spoke English. I was trying to make it out here. And then, you know, I joined the swim team to make some friends. Uh, and then um, during spring season, that's when the crew season was going on. And Coach Patrick, which was also the head coach for uh, Athlete Out Limits, he was uh, running a conditioning then. And I thought it was just a CrossFit workout. So I went in there uh, and then I was just doing the workouts on the rowing machine. I was like, this is kind of fun. And then the real season came in and then they slapped us with the uh, crew dues and they said, you have to pay, you know, 400 or $500 to be part of the team. And I was like, oh, nah. And then I left the team my freshman year. And then I came back my sophomore year uh, uh, because I was part of this uh, kind of leadership uh, club called B2I Youth. And then they decided to sponsor me to be part of uh, the Wakefield High School rowing team. So I went in and uh, I decided uh, to join the like the full time. And then, you know, I fell in love with it. And then it got me to the place I am right now. And then going back to the second question, what made it difficult? I'd say financial, because rowing is very demanding, like financially. It's a very expensive sport with food, with equipments, uh, with dues, uh, with regattas, everything. Um, and that made it difficult for me because not a lot of people know this, but Wakefield is kind of like on the south of Arlington, which is kind of like, I come from, uh, I used to come from a very low income community. So it kind of made it hard for me to, not just me, like my parents to kind of invest their money into, uh, you know, something I could just be doing an after school. Uh, that's where uh, a lot of the kids in my school kind of felt that about rowing as well. And that was kind of like a huge barrier for me. And second of all, um, the second barrier was that um, kind of like seeing people that look like me when I first came in. Uh, so I decided to bring in my buddies and I said, yo, join the rowing team. And they said, no, I don't know how to swim. And I was like, I'll teach you. So I taught a couple of my friends how to swim so they can come row with me. Uh, and then once you get out of the, the kind of like a comfortable environment, you go into college and kind of like a higher level and you see, you know, less minorities. And then that kind of made, made it like a little bit difficult to kind of move forward. So I'll go, um, the, uh, Craig, I didn't appreciate the hand gesture. I just want you to know that. And um, Dev, I appreciate Rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> I appreciate you calling me out, Dev. I'm very excited to um, get to know you a little bit more. I'm very good friends with David Banks and he speaks very highly of you. So um, I'm gonna say one of the things that made it difficult for me is, I mean, why did I stay? So, I, I mean, I was the first in my family to go to college. So uh, I was recruited out of high school. So the only way I was going to college is if it was absolutely, a, if I got a full scholarship. So I basically handled my business and I knew that the only way I was going to go to college is if I, it was free. I mean, and my parents were very clear about that. <laughs> That's why we sort of, we definitely went into it like a business deal and um, so I needed to get to college. I was the first in my family to go, and I, and and that was my that was my vehicle. I absolutely think rowing can be a vehicle to a better life. I think what made it difficult was it's incredibly isolating. The more successful I got, the more isolated I was, um, and I, and that is even in a team setting. You know, I mean, you you're the other, and you're the only, and you're traveling internationally and you're going to regattas and you're the only at the regatta, you're the only on the plane, you're the only in the airport, you're the, you know, it's it's debilitating and it is heavy. It's just, it's just heavy. And, you know, it's been interesting doing all these panel discussions, especially in this year and in this kind of current sort of cultural climate, because being black is just heavy right now. Like it's just tough. And, you know, I, I think I see a lot of similarities with, you know, what needs to happen and the changes we want to see in the Roman community. And I think that absolutely informs me as a business owner and just a, a, in creating a black space in a rowing environment, which is just never seen, it's never done. But I'm also incredibly grateful for my experiences because it has informed, absolutely informed the kind of program that I've built and the kind of community that we've built in. I think it's, 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 you know, my experiences are very, very, very prominent in how I shape things for sure. 
I'll go next. Um, we'll save the best for last, Craig. Uh, so <laughs> Uh, for me, I actually wanted to row in high school. It was my junior year and I just saw these, I was getting water and I just saw like these people rowing together, like making all this noise in the hallway. I thought it was so cool. So I asked someone what it was and they're like, oh, it's rowing. So I went home and I'm like, mom, I don't want to do basketball anymore. Can I do rowing? And she's like, okay, let's research it. And then it's the same old thing. There's no black people that do this. And also it was like, what are we going to do about your hair? And I was like, I don't think the point is to be in the water, but I could be wrong. So there was just a lot of cultural barriers. Um, it also wasn't connected directly to the school. So I was already on varsity. There were a lot of credits. We didn't, you know, it was like trying to get recruited. So it was just like, stay the course here. Um, so when I went to Ohio State Newark, it was, it was great for me because I didn't really know if I wanted to go to college um, from a military family. So I was like, I'm gonna go into the Marines, like let's go hardcore. And I had to give my mom one year of college. That was the, that was the, the agreement. Um, so I played there and then I was actually on my way to go play for Otterbein, which is a D3 school here in my hometown. And I happened to be walking around campus at Ohio State and someone's like, you look athletic, uh, would you like to row? And I was like, dream come true, everything I've ever wanted. And so I switched directions and I, I walked on to come row and it was, it was awesome. I was excited. Um, it was always a dream of my brother to play for Ohio State. He never got to do it. So it was an, a nice little connection between us. Um, and so to me, it was like, he didn't get to fulfill his dream. So I got to do it for him because um, I'm really close to my family. And I just thought it was awesome. Like I always grew up being a Buckeye. Um, what made it challenging, um, like Brennan said, and also Brooke was being the only one. Um, I think too, being a light skinned black woman that most people don't know what I am, depending on how I sound my hair or do my beautiful lashes um it's like I experienced Brennan you knew this was going to happen so I don't know why you're shaking your head um so I just I experience things a little bit differently I get them from all over the place um but I also leverage that privilege right like I I have the right pedigree I have the right skin color that's comfortable um so I leverage that for the fact of advancement for people of color and what that looks like um I also think and I, I've talked a lot about this with my my former teammates is that I was misunderstood a lot of times for my silence because I didn't feel safe um I wasn't able to be my authentic self and I think when we talk about DNI it's about being able to show up as your whole self um and I just wasn't able to do that and um there were things where I had to choose if I was going to check a teammate about what they said or you know wrapping the n-word and not getting invited back to the parties or you know disappointing myself and advocating for advancement just to be a part of the cool kid group um so I think for me there were just some well-being things that I had to choose and then ultimately um being a first gen I had to choose between graduating in four years or taking a fifth year to row and homegirl was not about to do that. So um, I ended up getting a really good um, internship, which led me to get a full ride to a master's program, which I never thought, but I got that because of rowing. Um, and I came back because I want, it's a beautiful sport. It's spiritual when you're on the water, uh, when that boat's running together, when you're in sync, even when you're in a single and you watch the sunrise, you know, there are many times I was in a single and I cried and it was just so therapeutic. Um, and I wanted to give a better gift. There were just reasons that I shouldn't have had to leave or I felt like I had to leave. And I, I felt like I was a vehicle for change in my community. So I came back because it's a wonderful gift and I cherish it. Um, <clears throat> I didn't row until college and William and Mary is like a really weird place. Uh, it's incredibly nerdy. Uh, it's not very diverse. So I think an undergraduate campus about like 5,000 kids, maybe, maybe like 270, 280 were African-American, like period. And maybe less than half of that were African-American males. So like wherever you go on campus, people are like, you know, uh, you know, all day in every classroom, uh, so that's, you know, that was a thing uh, that was real. I think the reason why, so that struggle was always there uh, in the in the rolling experience. Uh, but I think, you know, there were mechanisms and just structural things that happened that enabled me to stay with the sport in spite of the difficulties. So I had to work to get through college. 
you know, I, I had enough scholarships and grants to be able to cover everything except books and food. So, uh, so that, 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 that kind of stuff I had to work for. So I, I had a job. I worked at a deli, Paul's Deli, great place if you're ever in the Berg. Um, you know, uh, so that's how I, I did that. And rowing actually got me that job. So all the rowers on the team worked at that place. Um, so that was, that was an end for me. Uh, the dues obviously were a financial burden. So Brooke, I, I hear you. Uh, when they told me how much like the boathouse jackets were and, and the, you know, the summer, the spring training trips and the winter training trips and all that stuff, I was like, what? I was like, I gotta pay rent. Um, so, but there were mechanisms in place that enabled me to stay, right? So we did work weekends uh, in college because William Mary Rowing Team is a club. Uh, and uh, Williamsburg is, you know, only really two different groups of people. You're either like retired or you're under 30. Um, so, uh, you know, all the retired folk would, you know, just pay us to do works around their homes or do stuff for them. And that's how I was able to cover my financial obligation to the club. Um, so that mechanism made it really easy for, for me to say because, you know, I liked it. Uh, you know, was there beef every now and then with people on the team? Yes. Did I have to correct people when they came out of their mouth and said something they shouldn't have said? Yes. Uh, but, you know, I, I grew up around strong black women. So I knew how to open my mouth uh, when necessary. And uh, so, I mean, that helped. And there were a few, there were a few of us on the team. Uh, Michael Duarte, Duarte, there were a couple of other uh, young ladies of color who were on the team. So that helped a lot. Uh, and I had great coaches. You know, I had coaches who, uh, who didn't, who didn't uh, look at the color of my skin. It was just like, you know, here's the work and do it. Um, despite the fact that there may have been people on the team from year to year that were difficult to work with. So, I mean, for every, for every difficulty that you can imagine, uh, you know, a young athlete of color having to deal with, it was present, absolutely. But there were, there was something else, either like a structural thing or, or a person to cancel it out on the other end. So I guess that helped, that helped me stay with rowing uh, while I was in college. And, you know, it was at a time where like the country was changing, right? Um, like Barack Obama was just getting elected. The whole DMV area was changing uh, demographically. Uh, Virginia turned blue, you know, all this other stuff was like happening. And Williamsburg is incredibly liberal place and people are a little bit, you know, more open-minded in that area, I guess you can say. Um, so, I guess that's that's my college story and what helped me get with it. I think my biggest difficulties now are, you know, trying to expand it, uh, trying to expand access um, with the kids in the high school. That's been challenging um, because it was just like a different level of of difficulties, you know, like taking my mul my personal stuff and then multiplying it across sixty to hundred kids a year and having to figure all that out, that's a whole nother issue. So I'm so. Yeah, I mean, what, what I'm hearing is this common thread of two sides to the same coin with rowing, right? We're talking about how financially expensive this sport is and how that makes it very difficult for so many youths to access the sport. But as Brandon's talked about, as Ashley's talked about, as you've talked about, Craig, rowing also provided financial opportunities for you that then opened up doors. So it's two sides of this coin. And then the other thing being, you know, as uh, a, a black body in a very white space, having to navigate those lines of deciding, am I going to, as Ashley so beautifully said, be authentic to myself, be true to myself, and I feel that something is happening that I want to speak up about, or do I take the step of trying to fit in? And sometimes, I mean, I know I felt this myself of feeling guilty if I decide not to step up because I want to avoid not getting invited to that party or, you know, not being invited to that study session or whatever it might be. So thinking about this, this two sides of the same coin in the sport. 
And, um, you know, Craig, you already started speaking to this, but obviously you guys all started as rowers and now you are coaches. What have been some of the most important things from your perspectives as coaches in retaining youth of color? I mean, given your own experiences in this sport. Brandon, I see you shaking your head. I'm gonna, I need to, Ashley and Craig tell me all the time I need to fix my face on these calls. Um, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna be 100% honest and say, if we're being transparent, it is so, it is so hard for me. I carry so much weight with dealing with um, youth. And it's so funny because we just started building our youth program and I am so adamant that we work with these kids, but I'm transparent with these kids. I'm tough on these kids. And I am trying to, I'm less focused on retaining them and more focused on it, giving them an honest experience about what rowing is going to be, right? So whenever my kids are coming to me with like, hey, this happened, I'm like, yeah, we call that Tuesday, boo. Like, you don't, like, don't, you don't, I'm not, and, and it's so funny because one youth is like, yeah, she's terrifying and not sensitive. And it's because, you know, I'm, I want, if you're going to stay, or leave, I want you to do that with me because this is a safe space, right? If you don't have, if you're not gonna be able to make it, we need to, me and your parents and your team, and we need to, I wanna know that now because I, you're it, rowing, there's, we're talking about diversity and we're talking about change and it's really lovely. It's February, everybody's excited, we get it. But March is coming you know, and uh, things are going to go back to the way they were. So I mean, you know, so I really think it's important that we prepare our youth and, and, and our masters, you know, it's, it's not just the youth, it's the parents. It's my masters are so dope, you know what I mean? And understanding how we can be effective in our space, but I'm not focused on retaining them. I'm not, I'm focused on giving them a shot of life, giving them a shot of reality and then seeing how they how they handle it. Um, I think off of that, like if you're giving them that experience, they're gonna retain on their own. You know, like they're. I think it's been easy, not easy for me to recruit, um, but easier because I'm the vehicle of like, oh, I can see what's the possibility, right? Even though my experience, I felt like I left prematurely. Um, I can tell them I've been where they are. Like Brennan gets in the boat with, with her people. I row with my people. I get in the boat. I'm not just telling you what to do. I'm showing you. Um, and to being honest and raw, like we just had practice and I told the kids, I'm like, all right, we're getting ready for season. Do you want to make history just because you're the black kids that showed up? Or do you want to be make history because you're the black kids who showed up and then kicked ass and took names? Like, what do you want to do? Right. And, and they're like the second one. And I'm like, all right, so it's game time. Right. Like we need to, and, and, and we talked about some other things too, and what that looks like. And so I think for me, it's, it's the same thing. Like just having honest conversation. I can't stop so the racism or the bias that's going to happen. Um, but the difference than my experience is that you have someone who's been in that seat, <laughs> no pun intended, that can help you navigate how to tune it out. We'll address it how we need to address it game face here, let's do it, and then get you the resources you need to be able to still love yourself at the end of the day and, and continue to be on that podium. Um, and I think being able to walk them through that will allow them to retain because they have someone that can say, I see you and I believe you, I, I know. Um, and I think really that's where it takes is like just someone to say, I believe you and I hear you and that's valid. And we're gonna do something about that. And, and then we're also gonna make you a champion if that's what you want. I think that's super important. Um, I also think last thing, cause I can be long winded, but last thing is uh, I think what's been beautiful is that I initially was like, I'm gonna work with youth and it's been the adults. Like I've had hella adults are like, what about me? Um, and I'll, my first um, first two events were actually adult events, adult rows. Um, and I think that was super cool. And even now, like our parents row at our practice. Um, and, and that's really important to watch the bonds form. And if you can really empower um, and really allow them to empower themselves, the parents, as long as they're supporting you, man, it's, it's magic what can happen. Um, I, I guess I can, you know, 
in full transparency and honesty as well, uh, my my high school and rowing like experience had been really difficult, especially like at least from how I experienced, I was always the only, I was like always the only black person in the four years in high school and the four years in college. And then when I went back to coach my high school program, it, it, I don't think I had one person of color in the two years I was there. Um, so it's, this is honestly like one of the hardest things I have to go through is how do I, how do I provide that type of authenticity to people who, if I still can't get them through the door and then, then it goes and, and you know, they might come through the door and see, okay, this erg looks weird. I don't know what this thing is. So I can put them on there and be like, this is, this is difficult. This is going to be a difficult thing. You're new at this It might not come naturally, but we'll get through it. Um, and you know, we can get through that part. And then you tell them, all right, well, there's going to be a water aspect to this. There's going to be this that, and the other. And immediately it's like, okay, well, you've just introduced a part of this that I am incredibly uncomfortable with. I don't want to deal with. I, you know, it, they shut down. Um, and then that kind of like retention of that whole thing just kind of falls apart. And I like, that's just something that I've struggled with trying to do as a coach. Um, it's something I noticed as an athlete. Uh, it's just like, I think the spaces that I happen to inhabit during my like formative growing career were just very white. And that was, I think, I definitely know that was scary as a high schooler. And I can only imagine it's equally as scary as like on the other side of that. So I don't, I don't really have a good answer for retention because I, it's still something that I have that I struggle with a lot and I want to do better, but I don't know where to start if they won't come to the door. So. Yeah. Like these kids are wicked smart. Um, like all teenagers are. Uh, I, I just want to put that out there. Like regardless of, of skin color, kids are very, very, very intelligent. At least from like a, from a social perspective. Uh, they're very, very aware and cognizant of, you know, everything. The things we do, our facial expressions, like, you know, the, the attitude we bring to practice. Or at least my kids are. Like, they know. Um, they have a sense of what's going on. And I think <clears throat> like Brandon and, and, and Ashley and Ashley, like you like hit it on the head in your own way um, about, about honesty, right? Uh, Cause we, we, we don't lie to these kids. Um, it's just, it's just full brutal honesty uh, with respect to what it takes to be excellent, um, what, what the time commitment, what the expectations are in terms of like behavior, academics, uh, you know, athletic performance, where you need to be to be able to create options for yourself. Uh, and, you know, if you ever like dropped a microphone at, my, at one of my practices, I'd probably go to jail, but, uh, um, but like, we're just, we just, we're just super honest with the kids because you're definitely you know, you've ever seen, I've been at your practices. <laughs> like if you've ever seen, if you've ever seen Remember the Titans and that scene where, uh, uh, you know, he's, you know, Coach Boone is going after Coach Yost for coddling Petey. And he's just like, why are you doing this? He's just like, in the real world, these black kids aren't gonna, aren't gonna, you know, have you to be able to save them and be able to make things better. You know, when they're out in their professional career and they're, you know, talking to their boss, or they're trying to advance themselves or, or they're in college and they're in some class, you're not going to be able to save them. Like, tell them the truth. You screwed up, you know, and you need to do better. And, and like, that's really, really, really important. And I feel like I, at least in my experience, I know because I've done the whole gamut from like, you know, just mean cuss all the way down to <clears throat> the most supportive, like big brother ever. And that works more. Um, the honesty, you know, will keep kids there. Um, and I think in a way you can like debilitate kids, you can like cripple kids by, by, you know, 
and like undermine them for the long term by having like all these like overcompensate, like over rewarding and or like over like, you know, appealing to them in, in a way that pacifies kids, you know, or prevents them from just seeing the reality of the circumstances. If you want to earn or achieve this, you have to do this. Right. And it's going to take this much time and this much effort and these grades and all this stuff. And if you want to do all this crazy stuff, I am right here to tell you whether you're doing it right or not. And I will be here with you every step of the way. But you got to want to do it. And if you don't want to do it, there's a the door. You know, and, and, and I think that kind of like brutally honest support is something that a lot of kids are missing because not a lot of kids. You know, like, honest to God, like, take a moment and think, how many times do you, how many times do you ask a question about anything where you intentionally lie? Like, <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis, like, you know, like, all human beings can be like, yo, I lie my ass off on a day-to-day -day basis, like, regardless of what it is, right? You know, it could be like, how are you feeling? You know, uh, did you eat breakfast today? Uh, are, are you going to come to this meeting after in the, in, the, in the afternoon, like anything, you know, the smallest stuff, we just like lying our asses off left and right. Um, but like with these kids, like you can't do that. And they know, you know, and I feel like that's the bigger, bigger thing, right? If, if you're being in genuine with them, like they, they know. Um, and in my experience, I can just say that these kids are more likely to stay if you know that you you can see the uncomfortable truth and simultaneously you're willing to help them face it as opposed to ignoring it and saying you figure that out on your own you know and, and you know and, one thing i wanted to say too um is i think you know it's interesting i did a talk for uh, women entrepreneurs and they asked me you know what would i say to young girls and it's, it's interesting because, you know, I think Craig is absolutely so spot on when he's talking about honesty because, you know, I didn't, we, we're not able, we shouldn't sugarcoat it. It's, I think it's even more imperative that we don't sugarcoat it for, you know, black and brown youth coming up because at least if we, at least they're, they're going to get a shot. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, there was so much, rowing is a brutal sport. It's a brutal sport, right? That 2000 meter erg test is coming. You know what I mean? And I think whenever you are in a brutal sport and then you layer all of the other stuff that we're carrying on top of it, it gets so convoluted. And I think, you know, I had, a, I, my dad would always say, you know, at the end of the day, be like, you, we got to take care of business. And why are we here? And you have, you have to be tough enough. You know what I mean? And I think there is, if, if he hadn't sugarcoated, if he sugarcoated it, it, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have braced for impact. And I think Daphne, that's probably what everyone's saying in their own version is you gotta be braced for the impact, right? I mean, Daph, I mean, you know, as well, like what you, whenever you walk into when, that first N word that comes out and that first awkward thing, like I, I, your face gets hot, your body temperature rises, you, and you have a split second decision on how you're gonna handle it. You know what I mean? So if I'm throwing everything at you, you're prepared. I mean, I think that's the, that's the honesty. Um, I think um, we can all agree that um, rowing is a very demanding sport, uh, both physically and mentally. Um, and it can be hard to kind of move on as an athlete, as a rower, uh, if you don't have those two things. And then aside from that, it's also demanding with your commitment and time. And like me personally, like when I was having those difficulties, I was asking myself, like, why would I do this? I'm wasting my time. You know, I'm wasting half of my life doing something that I don't belong in. Uh, and then, which is why, you know, I kind of decided to be um, a coach uh, because I wanted to, um, Initially, before I became a coach, uh, you know, I was a volunteer, you know, co collegiate rower that used to come in over the summer and then kind of uh, help out my, uh, you know, my old uh, high school and I think without limits, helping ID rowers. 
and then also DC Strokes of your city youth, you know, helping inner city youth uh, know how to row. And then all these programs have kind of shaped me, become, have mentored me to become the coach I am right now. And then what I valued is all these three uh, programs, um, they all share equipments, uh, I mean, before Corona. Uh, so like, uh, <laughs> so like, you know, that kind of gave uh, all three programs a sense of family, a uh, sense of community, a uh, sense of belonging. You know, DC Strokes being one of the oldest, uh, you know, LGBTQ uh, community program. And then Wakefield being one of the, uh, you know, one of the low income high schools. And then, you know, I think that miss having all the ID athletes, you know, all three programs coming in together kind of shaped me to become the athlete I am and then the coach I am and I am going to be. Uh, so this had allowed me to kind of like, uh, you know, shape my athletes into uh, showing them different perspectives, you know. Uh, and then um, when I say athletes, uh, when I was rowing back, you know, back when I was in high school, uh, you know, like I said, I was recruiting most of my friends, but I was also recruiting my family because I know that if they didn't go to practice, I'll tell them their mom or something, you know. So they had to come and then be part of me. My cousins had to come and row and whatever high school they want so we can see each other at the regattas. And um, so this kind of, uh, what this did was kind of create kind of representation, you know, uh, so that when, uh, you know, more minority kids see other minority uh, kids do this sport, they're like, oh, okay, you know, I could do it too, because he does it too. You know, when I saw Akil Abdullah and, uh, um, uh, David Banks, uh, you know, uh, when I heard about their stories, I was like, yo, like if they can do it, you no, know, I can do it too. But if I didn't see them do it, you know, if I, all I see is Oliver Zeidler and everyone going up and I was like, oh, dang, this, I'm never going to be up there, you know, uh, so that, you know, creating that representation and then, um, you know, kind of like the athletes that I'm coaching, I'm not just coaching them to be good athletes, I'm coaching them to be good coaches as well, based on the mentorships that I've, you know, earned from Coach Patrick and then Mark Colson, whoever, and uh, Scott Wisnowski, my old former coaches, that have mentored me to be the person I am right now so that they can come back, you know, help the community and then kind of, you know, make uh, rowing more of like a family and then a sense of belonging for other, you know, uh, students of color as well. I'm struck by, you know, we've been talking about honesty, we've been talking about authenticity, but I think we're also talking about agency, right? If we are honest with our athletes, then we are giving them the power to make informed decisions about what they want to do. And the other thing is, you know, Ashley, and when you were talking about how you get in the boat and you row with your rowers and Brandon gets in the boat and Brandon rows with her rowers, that to me is the true definition of community rowing. And I think what Brooke's talking about with seeing examples of people who've come before him, who've gone through this sport, who look like he does, who've had similar experiences, that is another definition of community rowing and expanding, expanding what we think of when we think of what our, what our team is, so to speak. Um, so we've got in a couple of questions from the audience, audience members, and a couple of them have been about parents in particular. So I'm going to try and group them into one, one question, um, which is someone was wondering about um, programs that how do we engage parents in these programs so that they feel that there's a place for them as well in this sport um, as one way to help retain their kids in the program. And the other question, uh, Adding on to that was asking about programs that actually have parents and youth rowing together. So I wanted to see if people had thoughts on, on those two points. All right, well, like what I think we're, we're talking about ownership, right? And, and, that's what, and that's what all of this stuff like is. And, and that's what keeps people. When you, have, when you feel like you have a stake in the game, when you feel like you can control and, and like have a, have, a, have a say in what's happening, and you have a voice and your voice is heard and listened to, people are gonna stay, right? So like my parents, I've said this a hundred thousand times and I'll keep saying it. This program does not exist without our parents, period. Hard stop, right? Like I, in the first year, I did it for one year. Year one, I did everything. I coached, I took care of the food, you know, the transportation, all of this stuff. It damn near killed me. And after that, I was like, oh, hell no. And then I sat the parents down and it was like, and talk about honesty, it was like, look, if this were another program, no names included, somewhere else within a 10 mile radius, you'd be paying somewhere between 700 and $2,000 a season for your child to be able to do this. 
I'm not asking you for that much money. What I do you need to do, I need you to take care of transportation. I need you to make sure that if we're, uh, if we are going to a regatta, we have food. I need you to make sure that you are there to support your children because they need to see you on the sidelines because we're already the only people there in the first place. So I need you to like create like an envelope of love around them so that they feel comfortable when they go to race and compete. And when I tell you to be here so we meet, I need you to show up, period. And they're like, okay. And they did it. And, you know, so like, I don't hold money. We collect $75 from the kids a season and it's just for food. It's just for food. And trust me, those dads and moms, they stretch every penny to feed all of those teenage boys, soon to be teenage boys and girls, you know? And it's just like, here's the money, you deal with it. Here are the kids, you deal with them. And that it creates the space so that all I have to do is coach, you know? And then the parents have ownership because, you know, it's like, it's their program too. Um, so I like, that's like, it's, that's, that's like critical. Like if you don't have, and plus, you know, like family's big for minorities. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd tell you any other way. Like, you know, there are eight people in my house alone you know, and that's not including, that's not Thanksgiving. I won't tell you how many people are in my house at a Thanksgiving. It's just, you know, like family is really, really important. So being able to work that in wherever you can and however you can and give people the reins, it's a win. And I'm going to say for, so for our, for our community, um, you know, I, we've, we've been growing and developing and that is actually what we sell. You know what I mean? Like a sense of belonging is actually what we sell, you know? And I think, and family is so important. And um, I'm gonna say it was so smart of us to develop our master's program first, because now they, our youth is is so taken care of and so mentored and, you know, and Craig's guys have been there and Craig and I, I my parents and my master's rowers fight with Craig's parents about feeding his boys like it's bad you know what I mean ash is coming out in a couple of weeks and I mean like and it's because and it's not and, and I always say black owned doesn't mean black only so you know we, we absolutely have white people that are absolutely invested in our mission and what we're doing and you know they're so excited we had to cancel a visit like they're so excited to host and so excited to 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 be the space where you know these programs can come and relax and develop and learn and we can grow together and I think you know family is so important I think because I grew up in such a strong black family it absolutely permeates everything that we do in our business and all I did was figure out how to make it the mission you know what I mean and I think once we once we made that our focus everything else starts to fall into place you know what I mean and I think that is really why we've survived and why we've made it and you know, why we're, we do things very, very differently because you have to make the community the focus. You know, I mean, mentorship and uh, my, our staff gets mentored. And even though they're training for the national team, even though they're training, you know, for at a higher level, there's still this whole thing called life that my staff is navigating. They're in their 20s, they're, you know what I mean? And we have, Black men and women that are in their 50s and 60s that are able to invest into these kids and take them for coffee and to sit them down and to have these conversations. And, you know, it really makes us, it creates a synergy that is absolutely amazing. So, you know, the parents are important. And I would also say master's rowers are important. You know, I do learn a rose. Not only is that how we make money, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's our bread and butter. But it also is such an incredible, it is a fountain of information, a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of, you know, Brandon, I've got this skill, we had an issue and it's like, hey, I know this person, I know this person, you know what I mean? You never know who you're going to meet. You never know who you're going to inspire. You never know who's going to want to come and participate. Now, our master's program, they, meant, they basically run anything the youth need. Like I say, hey, we need jackets. The, the, it, these are not even the parents. I don't even I don't even go to my parents. I go to the master's rowers. Like, hey, the youth need this. And the master's rowers pony up 
and I don't even have to go to the parents. Like the parents are tech. Like my master's role is like the parents are tech enough. Tell, tell us first, and if we can't get it, then we'll think about asking the parents. You know what I mean? And I think there's just this really dope synergy. Like Craig, uh, there's a Craig's been coming to us, and a BLJ is reached out wants to give him a donation, and it's just because he's been here what four or five times, maybe Craig. Stay sick yep. to make me look good. It's been a lot and it will continue to be a lot. But I mean, you know, I got a call and it was just like, hey, I want to give this to St. Benedict's and I want to help Craig because, you know, he, we had some great conversations and I know I want to help his boys. And, and I think that, that is, that's, that's where real change lives. That's the magic of it. Yeah, I'll just quickly add from the parent side just to give a story of how we've built that. Um, from day one, I've asked the parents like, hey, would you be interested in rowing? And one particular that is a win, she's like, I will never ever row. I'm here for my daughter, that is it. Don't ask me again. And I ask her every single time I see her. Um, her daughter is also a pageant queen. So um, she was telling me how she wasn't gonna be at practice cause she had a beauty pageant. I was like, oh, I've never been to one. I'd love to come. <clears throat> and so I had, all of our, her teammates create a video to wish her good luck because it's Corona. So not everyone could be there. So we sent her all a message individually. Um, I showed up with my mom. So we talk about family. My mom is my executive assistant, um, best executive assistant ever. And we were there. And that and those are the things when we talk about not just about rowing. And there was a moment where she bobbled, but she picked herself up when she was walking and she was flustered at um, during the break. And I was like, have you caught a crab before? And we talked about, we related it to how you have to keep rowing, right? And her mom was like, I think it's funny that we're at a beauty pageant and you're talking about rowing. I was like, it's always rowing, no matter what. But that cemented to her, I care more about your kid than just what they're gonna pull. I'm showing up on a Sunday, I'm bringing my mom, I'm coming and I'm watching you tell me what I'm supposed to wear. I'm gonna get our, her, her teammates to support her. I mean, they had only been rowing together for three weeks. So they didn't really know each other like that, but they showed up for her, even when they couldn't physically. And a month later, she's like, all right, coach, can I come to practice and row with the kids? And I was like, of course. And so now every Saturday, she rows with us. And this is a woman who told me from day one in October, she was never gonna do it. And I think those are the things is you have to keep asking and constantly showing up, not just showing up when it's convenient for you, not just showing up when you want to have a quota, not just showing up when it's going to look nice for a brochure, but genuinely wanting to show up and consistent. I literally ask her after every practice, well, can't wait for when you get in the boat, when you're going to get in the boat, when you can come row with us, uh, you know, and as she saw her daughter unleashing her inner beast, as we like to call it over here. She's like, I want a little bit of that magic too. So I think that it's really important that you really care about wanting more. And if you do that, they'll give you more. And uh, adding on to that, you know, I was lucky enough to have a supporting family, uh, mostly monthly. And uh, they couldn't come to most of my regattas, but I've seen other family and parents uh, come into, uh, you know, my teammates regattas. And then I've seen how, you know, the kids were happy and they wanted to do better because their parents were there. You know, they were so excited to see their parents walk around the regatta side with their parents and the parents are, you know, they're feeding us a lot of food and stuff. And, uh, you know, like the parents letting the kids know that, hey, you know, I'm right there with you. Like, you got this, you know? Uh, you know, my parents weren't physically there to do that because, you know, they were, they were working two to three jobs a day. Uh, but they were calling me saying that, yo, how did you do and stuff like that. Uh, and then when it comes to family, uh, you know, like I said, like, you know, our boathouse and the Costa Community Boathouse was, you know, was a big family. Uh, so DC Strokes was the head program. And then we've had all these small, pro uh, was the head rowing club. And we've had all these small programs come in. And basically, like, you know, I remember my novice, uh, my novice year, uh, we had like a, a Vespoli from 1980 or something like that. And that was the boat we were rowing in. And then we moved to my junior year and, uh, you know, we can't race like that on like, you know, competitive event. So DC Strokes came in and then they were like, yo, you can use our new Vespoli boat. And then we were like, oh, okay, bet. And then we were able to kind of, you know, have all these equipments because, you know, we were one big family and, you know, all these, uh, the, their DC Strokes a master's program, uh, the club is a master's program. So they were there mentoring us uh, most of our coaches derived from that program as well. So they were there to kind of guide us 
and to uh, you know to be better athletes and stuff like that and then so those the, definitely matters like family support definitely matters So we're almost out of time. This hour has flown by and I want to ask one final question, um, which is about the organizations, the national organizations, the international organizations that help to govern the sport of rowing. If each of you could summarize in one word, the key thing you think those organizations need to do for us to help with retention, what would it be? Accountability. Action. Ownership. I'm gonna say transparency. It's a hard question. I'm gonna say inclusiveness. Thank you. These are these are so powerful. And you know, like Brandon said, this is February, it's Black History Month, but this is not the end of this conversation. And we hope that for everyone who's tuning in, who's listening to this today, that you also take away from this message that just because it's February doesn't mean that these conversations, that the work that's being put in now stops at the end of this month, that we continue these things as we move forward. Um, I want to thank everyone so much for joining us here today. Uh, thank Growing in Color for helping to amplify this work. We are going to be having another event in about two weeks and um, stay posted on uh, your social media for further details about that. But I really just want to thank everyone. Um, and given that we have two more minutes, I do want to ask one more question, which I wanted to end on on a kind of positive note. Obviously, these are heavy times. Um, what is something that is bringing you joy? One sentence. Brandon's Instagram page. <laughs> Someone should put Brandon's Instagram handle in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I, I would also say Brennan cussing us out in our group chat. Um, it keeps me real spicy. No, I, I um there's so much black black joy that's and I'm glad that we're having this conversation about um, just celebrating ourselves. I think for me, what has been a saving grace is truly being a part of the Black Coaches and Rowers Association. Um, I mean, y'all have been so freaking amazing, and I put on these lashes, so I'm not gonna cry, and I'm gonna meet myself now. Um, I'm gonna say one thing that's bringing me joy besides drinking uh, is. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that, is um, being able to see people that look like me grow and develop. You know, I think uh, Craig called me and, you know, he's like, he, we, had to, we had a couple of things we needed to talk about. He's like, hey, B, like, first of all, we got to hang out. Like, I literally so enjoy being able to talk shop and so I'm like, you ain't going to believe what happened to me, you know what I mean? Telling my like, oh my gosh, stories and being able to decompress and vent and really sort of be around colleagues that look like me. I absolutely love, you know, for so long it was like, hey, BLJ Community is the only black owned row organization. And I was like, Ash is here, Akil was like, so I have to change it. I'm like, yes, there's like two of us, get excited, <laughs> you know? There's but three now, Kia, there's three. The, I am getting such joy from watching this the, the movement and watching people in the rowing community. You know, last six, seven, eight years, I've been in this work for a long time. It's been a lot of talk. And, and I think change is cumbersome. I think it's arduous and it's also very subversive. I am seeing people want to participate in change. I'm seeing people put their money where their mouth is because racism is about economics. I'm seeing people really want to stand in the gap and start to create something different. And that is bringing me mad amounts of joy. Sorry, Dap, that was like four things. That's all right. Jordan, Brooke, what about you guys? Um, I really just paid, like, kind of already said everything. Uh, just the fact that there are people out there that are having the same conversations, you know, 
good and the bad. I think the few conversations I've had a few times have been like, like, damn, did you hear about this again? And then just having that like camaraderie of knowing like, okay, somebody else is also feeling that like, that like weight on your shoulder almost. It almost is like one of the most like uplifting things to know that I'm not like going crazy or like, I feel like I'm overdoing or anything like my, my feelings and my, my like mental state, um, especially over the last like couple months, especially have been like validated because I finally, and you know, I think we've all been out there. There just hasn't been that much like ability to really have these conversations, but um, especially over the last couple months, having that like ability to sit down with someone and say like, yo, this just happened. How do you feel about this? And know that it's not just going to be like brushed off um, his like brought me so much joy, like helped my mental state immensely just because I'm, it was, it was tough. It was tough for a while. So having like this, these type of conversations with people that look like me and knowing that things are actually changing as long as, you know, we keep it going past February. Um, I think that's, that's a really nice like feeling and knowing that this change is coming. Um, Hope we could a little or quicker, but you know, I'll, I'll take what I can get at the moment. Awesome. Uh, and for me, what brings me joy is that the hope that, you know, change is going to happen, you know, seeing all five of you here and seeing BCRA, you know, go from eight to, I don't know how many of you are, too many, but uh, that kind of gives me joy. And then, you know, going out on my single with Marco Bovo, shout out if you're here. Uh, and that gives me joy for sure. Awesome. Well, I, I believe that change is coming. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. Really, really appreciate your time, your energy, the work that you're doing. We so appreciate you and everyone have a great night.